So, okay, we have Mark and Shane here for the lightweight men's pair uh, final of the World Championships in 2017. So you've got the lineup there. Who were the guys you were kind of watching out for? Like, was it anybody's race or were there guys in particular that you were concerned about? Yeah, I suppose um, the Italian crew there, they, they were very good all year. Um, they were after winning under 23s and they um, they did quite well against us in uh, Europeans that year as well. And there was um, the Russian boat, but we kind of knew, we spoke to them beforehand and they were after borrowing the boat out in Sarasota and it kind of wasn't going to plan and things for them. So they, were, they weren't very confident going into the race. We knew that. And okay. so um, there was also the Brazilian lads as well. And of course, um, Sam and Joel, uh, the Great Britain boat, they were, they were um, last the year before we finished fourth and they finished third. And throughout the year, there was kind of a bit of a to and fro between us. But it was all like we get on really well with them or whatever, but they're always the ones to watch. You know, they, they had very good experience and they had won the world champs in 2015. So we knew that they, they could have been very strong that day as well. So, you know, it was probably anyone's game, you know. Um, but you had in earlier competitions, you had come in kind of as the the favourite. We had, we had yes, um, we raced Lucerne eight weeks before this uh, regatta, I believe, and uh, we did we beat I think everyone was at that except the Italians, of course, they were at under twenty threes, but mm. we had uh, beat them all. But I suppose eight weeks was a long time too, you know. You'd be trying to think. Uh, you know was it was our trend going to plan and whatnot um and what could other people do in that eight weeks i guess and also you have to factor in the heat it was very very humid out there um so that was um that was a big factor for us i thought but we dealt with that quite well in the build up in the trend camp in Baniolas and things so we did a lot around the climatization yeah um, so you really fire out of the start and it, for maybe someone not clued in onto your race plan or your training regime, it looks like a start and basically 200 strokes, like not a start and 10, but a start and stay yeah. up and going. Was that actually the race plan or is there a bit more to it? I suppose we <clears throat> we started racing like that at the very start of the season, and uh, it's not like it. Or was it European, Shane, when we kind of introduced that first? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. And it it really it wasn't something we planned, and it, it, you could almost say it was organized chaos, and we just kept going, and we're just trying to. It, Generally, you come off a start and you go down onto a race pace and settle and you kind of try and start taking longer strokes where I suppose we just kept fighting the whole way through just to make sure that we try and win the bloody thing. And uh, I, it, it worked. So I suppose we kept doing it. And um, it's not uh, the most traditional way of rowing. And... Uh, I don't think anyone would want to coach it. I know a lot of coaches don't like looking at it, but it it was very effective of what we were actually doing. Hundred percent. And why do you think it it worked for you guys? Like, I, maybe it's just you're picking up the boat Shane well O'Driscoll and just keeping it up. Like, huh? We had Shane O'Driscoll in the boat. Simple <laughs> yeah. as. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> well, on. did you have to like train your change your training to to be able to maintain that? Like. I do remember our, our steady state did um, uh, change quite a lot because uh, at the time, as, as Shane was saying, we're in Bagnoles and when we're back in Cork, we would have done a lot of uh, paddling either with the, the lightweight double, mm. uh, the two boys at the time was Gary and Paul. And uh, we'd, be, we'd be paddling away with them and sometimes we'd be neck and neck or we'd even be faster than, than them paddling. And, but we were... Uh, taking more strokes than they were and our stroke rate during paddling was 28 uh, between 26 to 28 for how many k's would be on the water so uh, we did change on how we rode but um, we were still within um, our aerobic threshold of staying within 
our steady state. So whatever we're, uh, whatever output we're using, yeah. we're kind of clearing it at the same time. So. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. And then, so you were kind of used to as well, getting out in front and staying in front. Um, how did you feel in this race? Did you feel under threat? Um, so say here you're coming through the, where are you now? You're at the 500 or the 1K, sorry. Um, and you've just got about a length lead. Were you happy yeah. with that position or were you, you um, worried about Cruz coming back? I suppose, I think before this race, uh, there was like a 10 minute, um, I don't know what was happening, but it was a delay for 10 minutes. <clears throat> so I don't know, was there an alligator or something on the course? But uh, during that <laughs> 10 minutes, I suppose it's a long time to sit at a world championship final, you know, just sitting there. And I thought we probably handled that quite well because um, Mark just started talking through the race plan and I knew I had to stay calm and not, not go out too hard or whatever. But I think maybe we did it a little bit too well. And um, into maybe the 250 meter mark, we weren't leading and we we're lagging behind a little bit. So I kind of, I remember thinking at the 250 meter mark, I'll have to go now if I want to win this. You know, you just got to get up on the rest of the field maybe because that's the way we were planning and doing things. And I just wanted to stick to that plan as much as I could. But um, they weren't letting us through too easy. I think it, it took a while, you know, until maybe 700 until we took the lead. But uh, the heat didn't really set in around 800 or into the K. I remember my mouth completely drying out and uh, it was almost like I was after digging the grave. I mean, you know, I had to stay in it at that stage in and just get on with it. But yeah, it was uh, obviously if you lead a race, you know, you don't want to get too far ahead. You want to kind of stay in touch and distance because the crews will come back at you at the end, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, you want a little bit left for the sprint. And especially we saw the day before there were semi-finals and we've seen uh, some of the lightweight, I think there was a lightweight um, from Poland. He was uh, in a semi-final position. He just blew up completely with 100 metres left, just with the heat alone, you know. Right. So we didn't really want that to happen either. So, um, yeah. So was that on your mind, like a bit more of a fear that it could influence your race plan? That you know, A, li a little, yeah. But I suppose we still really want to lead the race um because that's what we that's what we were doing all year i suppose but uh yeah like yeah it's gonna yeah it's gonna play a factor in your mind all right but i suppose it was just a matter of staying ahead of them and just trusting yourself that you could stay going you know yeah the line and it was maybe a bit of fooling yourself saying just the next 250 the next 250 you know but yeah definitely it was um, yeah. you can see at the end then the crews were coming back at us a little but we could afford to let them back a little bit but like uh, although you are at race 46 here like the Italians aren't for, far behind you at, at race 44 and do you think maybe this kind of style is suited for the lightweight men's pair um, or do you think it is something that like could work for other crews as well I suppose um, a lot of crews might try it and uh, it might suit them, but um, it just really worked for us. Um, yeah. You know, uh, you can see the higher stroke rate. Um, it's where we pick up uh, the the catch and uh, so the yeah. timing of the front. Um, we were able to time the front quite nicely, and um, we were we got the load on on the blade on the face of the blade very early, uh, and yeah. so we we're able to stand off it and then. It was very good the way I always knew what way Shane was going to enter the blade, so I could always just slip it in at the same time. We both squeezed the boat, and then yeah. you can see that it won't be fishtailing the the stern as much because, yeah. of course, the more you fishtail the boat, uh, the it's a bit of leakage, so you're wasting power and stuff, and then you don't want to go on the tiller and all that kind of. Stuff. Um, so absolutely, yeah. No, you're just keeping the boat up high, really, is what it looks like. But it, you're not stir and tea like just rating you're actually just keeping the boat up so yeah no spot on so um we miss there just you crossing the line like i know like i've rode with you guys for years since we were 100, 123 um 
it was a long journey, right, to, to World Championship. Um, you're obviously a long number of years in the sport. Do you think this, like, epitomized and made it all worth it? Was it... What it's did it mean fun. to you guys, I suppose, being a world champion at the end? I'm, I'm the older of the two by a few years. Uh, Shane's a young pup. Um, and I think, it, well, like, I suppose I always believe there's no such thing as overnight success. And unfortunately, uh, uh, for me, I'm not the most talented, but it's kind of like grinding it out and just getting the most out of it. Um, of course, it did take years and persistence and a lot of hardship we went through uh, with with different, we went through many cycles, different coaches, you're always focusing on different boats and different years. And then it was when first then, was it 2014 when we rode together first, Shane? 15, yeah. 15, 15 yeah. yeah. So like we started out with a goal uh, and uh, that, that didn't work out, but then we ended up uh, pairing back a four-man boat into a two-man boat, and that really excelled. And I suppose yeah. we we had quite a drive to succeed, and a lot of it was that uh, the barriers are thrown in front of us, whatever they were. We really did try and break them down, and I suppose we weren't uh, given up without a fight. Yeah, no, one hundred percent. And like I think. <laughs> there's no better accolade to walk away with it than a world championship and like the long journey just makes it all the more valuable but also i think there are no overnight successes in in rowing and even those that we see now like within ireland um it's still taken them probably 10 years of training to actually get there um, yeah no one yeah. sees the fight uh yeah channel, so have you anything to add to Shane there? I don't want you to um, miss out your opportunity on this one. <laughs> yeah, I suppose the year before, like, um, we finished fourth at every race we went and we did a good few World Cups and we did the European Championships and the World Champs and we finished fourth. And I suppose, yeah, it's a tough position to finish in, but I often think maybe if we didn't finish fourth in all those races that maybe we wouldn't have won or maybe not won everything the following year just because during the winter and the springtime we did really knuckle down and we had a solid goal just to get a medal that year you know and we'd have been happy with any medal at any race really just get the fourth place off the our back kind of so um yeah i think you know it really paid off that year but i suppose it was a building stone like that just the fourth place in 2016 you know it did set us up in one, in yeah. one way you know yeah yeah no I that was i, do, I do remember uh, the four place in the world champs and crossing the line and going i never want to do this again i'd never want i prefer to come fifth or or else in the medals it's 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 yeah. fourth is the worst and i remember going not doing this again and i do remember shana saying like we we did have a severe hunger and a severe bite to actually go out and do stuff and I suppose uh, it was just the, the commitment and the de dedication of uh, yeah. having that goal really really did pay off at the end and um, so when you say not doing this again you mean not coming forth again not uh, not coming not forth again, again. Yeah. 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 trying to avoid it as much as we can oh. but try and do what we can to avoid it uh, yeah it's not the yeah. nicest place to finish no 100% I've been there yeah, and um, one other another question. Um, do you have like a favorite session, let's say, in the lead up to a world championship that kind of gives you that extra bit of confidence that okay, yeah, we're ready for this? Like, is there one session in particular, maybe you need, you remember even in the in the lead up that you thought, yeah, we're on fire, like we're ready to race? For me, um. There's a lot of sessions, but it's mostly going with because Shane is such a stats guy more than I am. He always knows who the competition is, what they've done, or I suppose I'm a little bit more of a layman and I just go in and row it. But um, when he's happy, I'm happy. And I'll let Shane answer the nitty gritty. <laughs> um, yeah, I suppose I remember we would train really hard on the training camps before Europeans in May of that year. We um, we had a really tough camp in Italy and 
I think we saw some of the high rating and some of those pieces, but we uh, did a few 1Ks and 500s and things in the lead and, and they were terrible. Like we were just so fatigued that they were just awful timing. And I remember there was an Italian coach there and he kind of asked, he asked me one day, oh, what did you do for the 1K or whatever? And I kind of hesitated, but Gary overheard it. And he, he just came over and said, oh, I think it was like 310 or something. He said, oh, he's straight up lying. <laughs> because it was it was terrible like I couldn't be saying the times we were getting we we're just very very tired and um the same thing actually happened in Bagnolas as well they were terrible times but like before each regatta I just I suppose I learned that you know the training sessions you just get through them and do as good as you can mm. and don't get too obsessed with uh with the times and all that but then the week of the regatta I felt that the boat started singing along and that it was all the hard training started paying off then. And you might do a little bit of prep over there and um, just a few days before the race and uh, the boat would really sing along and you'd know that you're in good shape then. And when it came to Florida then as well, I think when when uh, we there's a big risk of our boat actually not uh, arriving, so we were rowing a heavyweight. Uh, it was... Uh, heavyweight Felipe and I remember going we were really uh, just focusing on like right if this is what we're going to race and we'll make the best of it but when yeah. our boat actually did arrive all oh, the difference was otherworldly uh, so we were very glad of that and um, when it goes in with the training camp and if the times are <clears throat> times are a little bit slower you can always uh, compare to the other crews yeah. that were there because if everyone else is a little bit back, you know it's not just you, so you can yeah. take a little bit of confidence in that, that it, it is due to fatigue, or else in Bagnoles, it could be the, the spring water coming up at the 1500, or else if it's in uh, Italy, it's more than likely glacier water that is a bit colder, so yeah, yeah. there are some factors that... Yeah, you can uh, completely read into time. Any yeah. Stretch. Um, so... What about your combination? What What do you think about the Mark and Shane pair combination that made it work? And like, what kind of role did you take within the crew? Well, I suppose um, you can answer that for each other, maybe. <laughs> no, I suppose like uh, I suppose Mark was a few years older than me all along, and I suppose I always, you know, was thinking about stepping up into the senior level when I was under 23 and then I got the opportunity to row with him and um, race with him then later in the year so that was you know I really relied on his experience and things and it was very good and I think that stuck with me all along because he, he's very experienced and he has great knowledge of the science behind the sport and um, he's quite good with the mechanical side of it like just um, I suppose the pitching and our boat set up and all that as well so I did really rely on him um I kind of was the one to sometimes just keep my mouth shut and just listen to him and just go with that um and I think that did pay off a lot you know uh especially during just the build up into the race and um it would be crystal clear like what what would be going on then there would be no arguments in the boat and I think that that did help a lot you know yeah for sure yeah I think the main thing is really like we did get on very well. Uh, there weren't many bad days. Um, like we spent how many days uh, together? Um, I saw Shane more than my girlfriend. So um, to be honest, Shane was my number one, you know. <laughs> uh, like, you know, I'm spending morning, noon and night with the guy. I live with him. Um, and to say that you've only had a few bad days or a few bad sessions yeah. in over a couple of years is really a godsend. Like, um, mm. that's a test of any relationship. <laughs> um, and yeah. he, he's probably very good at holding his tongue when I was probably saying stuff that I shouldn't have been saying. Um, but I think we, we both had the desire to go fast and we, we had a common ground there. Yeah. So we both relied on each other uh, as equals really in that yeah. sense. Um, and to be fair, 
out of everyone I rode with, he's the only man to actually put up with the abuse for so long. <laughs> I, broke I broke everyone else. So. Well, it paid yeah. off for him in the end, so yeah, you, go, you got two world champions. <laughs> um, okay, I think that, that covers it all, unless there's anything more you want to add, but just massive thank you for um, taking your time and giving us a bit of an insight into the mindset um, that got you to the gold medal and world championship. Thanks very much. Thank you, Claire.